Thank you. Um, I've actually just moved in the last two weeks to uh, University of Glasgow. Uh, so, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, good. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to, first of all, just say thanks for the invitation to be here. I really appreciate this. Uh, this, this diagram or, or nice illustration you see here from Johnson and Henfries in the mid 1800s uh, provides a really nice starting point for what I wanna talk about today. And what they're illustrating here is if you look at different mountain ranges from the Andes uh, to the Himalayas or Alps or Pyrenees, uh, what they're illustrating is how as you change latitude but also elevation, you get different ecosystems, different types of vegetation. What I'm going to investigate today is kind of to fast forward and then ask the question, how do these different types of vegetation actually influence mountain topography? Uh, in the spirit of this, this conference, we've been exploring this in my group uh, from looking at extreme events to seasonal variations to millennial timescale variations. And what I'm gonna focus on today is just the millennial timescale variations in ve vegetation and erosion that occur. Uh, and I'm gonna minimize the number of equations I show and focus more on the model coupling that we've had to do. I should also mention, we've been doing a lot of observations to kind of test these models, but I won't have time to go into these today and would be happy uh, to address some of these questions. So if we look at a beautiful mountain range, like one of my favorite ones here uh, in Patagonia, uh, we, we commonly think about like how these, how these landscapes evolve and, and the conventional wisdom now is that we have this interaction between tectonics, climate, paleoclimate, and surface processes. And over the last decades, we made a lot of progress in trying to understand this and understanding the complexity of this. Uh, but what's a little bit different and oftentimes forgotten is, is, especially if you come from a tectonics background such as me, is that you have all this vegetation that's acting on top of the surface here as well. And these are just incredible little beasts here. They are biogeochemical reactors that are weathering rock, to get the nutrients they need. Uh, but in addition to that, there's also tremendous interactions with the Earth's surface in terms of their stems obstructing flow, increasing surface roughness, and those types of things. So that's what we wanna look into here. Now, I'm of course not the first person to be interested in this problem. Uh, there's this very seminal work here by Longbine and Schoem in 1950s. And what they found is that if you look at uh, different rivers around the world and the effective precipitation and the sediment yield, or you can think of it as the erosion rate of these mountain ranges, uh, what you see is this uh, kind of bi-directional nonlinear response. And they attributed this to uh, different ecosystems, whether you're in deserts, grasslands, or forests here. Pretty clear, makes sense, more vegetation, less erosion. Well, in the years following this, uh, a lot of other people have tried to reproduce these measurements. And there was a nice summary of this by Cliff Reby. Uh, and what you're looking at again is a very similar plot, average precipitation versus catchment average erosion rates. And each one of these lines is a different study and you get a bowl of spaghetti basically. Now I have an answer for why this looks this way. Unfortunately, I can't get to it, but what it raises is the question that uh, we may not actually understand how this system works. And it raises the question then of, do we actually consider biota in this kind of process coupling here as being significant if we're thinking about the long-term evolution of, of mountain and upland landscapes here? So what I'm going to do in this talk today is test this hypothesis here, that, uh, which is basically the Longbine and Schoem hypothesis, that vegetation influences erosion by having a bi-directional effect depending on the climate or ecological zone that you're looking at. So the remainder of this talk, I'm going to focus on these two points here. I'm going to spend a lot of time kind of uh, illustrating to you what took us the most time, which is a coupled modeling approach uh, to address this problem. And then I'll, I'll conclude with a short little uh, example from uh, some work we have in progress on how this varies over millennial timescales. Okay, so this is the system we wanna try and understand. So what we've basically done is set up a series of coupled models uh, that reflect each of these different boxes here. So I'm gonna walk you through these. The goal then is to understand how uh, landscapes will evolve like this. Now these models I'm gonna be showing you, we've tuned them to South America, to the coastal Chile area, uh, but everything I'm doing is very generic landscapes, trying to understand the process interactions that are occurring there. So let's start with the paleoclimate model. Uh, what we're doing is running general circulation models, and we've done two different approaches here. 
If you're not familiar with this, so we're running global scale models. These are discretized in space and in elevation. And then you have boundary conditions that reflect things such as the land surface cover, sea surface temperatures, greenhouse gases, yada, yada, yada. Okay, so the two approaches we've done here are to look at, uh, to use, first of all, the Trace 21K experiment. This is a beautiful experiment. It's a continuous simulation from the last glacial maximum to present. The downside is that it's very coarse resolution. We've augmented that with high resolution simulations we've done with the ECM-5 model. By high resolution, I mean 80 by 80 kilometers. And we've done this at discrete time steps that you see here uh, with the idea of checking how, how valid the results are then from, from these coarser simulations. And in fact, they work quite well. To give you an example of what's going on here. So this is, uh, you're looking at the difference in mean monthly precipitation, the differencing between the LGM and pre-industrial times. And what you see going on here, these flashing blue and red colors actually represent precipitation differences on the order of 100 to 500% that are occurring between individual months. Now, accompanied with this, you of course also have uh, large temperature changes and also large CO2 changes, uh, all of which make a difference for how vegetation will evolve over this, this time period. The next step then is vegetation. And uh, the way we've dealt with this and similar to, to paleoclimate, uh, we can't really rely on proxies because they're too uh, disparate in space and in time to get a continuous understanding of how vegetation or climate changes. So again, we've resorted to numerical modeling for this. What we've done is coupled a dynamic vegetation model with uh, the climate and landscape model. And the model we're using is called LPJ Guess. This is kind of a state-of-the-art dynamic vegetation model. It functions. Uh, Cool thing about it, you feed it climate and CO2 levels, and it calculates uh, basically plant physiological responses to those changes, and additionally uh, looks at competition between different plant functional types. So what you see on the right-hand side here, everything is, is parameterized in terms of a plant functional type. So if you're not familiar with what that is, this would be like grasses, trees, shrubs, and you we typically define about 20 different plant functional types. What's shown here in the upper plot is that you have some environmental space where different species uh, would thrive. So this is the performance uh, within an individual niche. And then when you add in competition and how these things interact, what you get is a realized niche, which is that under certain environmental conditions, you would get one plant functional type more dominant than the other. And you essentially get kind of a stand, a patch here uh, that gives you a different composition or relative abundances of things like plants. Uh, sorry, grass, uh, shrubs, and trees. So the way this kind of links with the climate model is that we start with coarse resolution uh, trace 21k simulation here with different time steps, okay? And we have a topographic surface, which I'll get to in just a minute here, but we downscale that high resolution, or sorry, low resolution paleoclimate simulation to higher resolution over this landscape here. And then we classify this landscape in, in terms of uh, different kind of ecosystem zones where different uh, plant behaviors might occur. So for example, valleys, hill slopes, and versus ridges here. The end result then is that uh, after a suite of coupled simulations like that, you get in, in LPJ guess, you get a prediction of these the relative abundances of these things. So I wanna give you an example of how this, the results from this and how this works. Uh, still not looking at the topography yet. And to do this, we're going to go to uh, coastal cordillera of Chile. Uh, this is the earth-shaped study areas, which I'm uh, the co-director for. And this is a large German Chilean uh, research initiative that's just coming to a close here. What we have are a series of uh, observatories that I've set up. And these go from the Atacama Desert in the north, which you see over here, all the way down to uh, temperate rainforest. So you're looking at an extreme climate and vegetation gradient. And the cool thing, you might be wondering why look at the Atacama. Well, this is actually the control case. This is a world with very, very little vegetation to compare to. So as an example, what you see shown here is the vegetation, total vegetation cover that we predicted for Chile. The numbers refer to the study areas I just mentioned too. And this is a model prediction that was produced from the 21K or trace 21K climate history from LGM to present. And uh, we've compared this with present day 
vegetation cover from, for example, MODIS data, and they agree very well. And furthermore, in addition, if you look at individual plant functional types like grasses, shrubs, trees, it's capturing the relative abundances of those with latitudes. So we have a fair amount of confidence in how that works. Now at any different point on, on this type of diagram here, uh, you can look at it in more detail. And I'll show you just the southernmost one because this has the largest amount of change uh, compared to the Atacama. So this would be an example here. What's on the x-axis is time before present from 21,000 years ago to today. The lowermost panel here is the fraction of plant cover. In, uh, so please ignore the black line, that's something else. Uh, so this is the vegetation cover for different types of vegetation. And what you see here is that the um, total amount of vegetation cover doesn't change that much. Okay, you get some oscillations down here, but it's on the order of 10, 20% change in vegetation cover. What does change a lot is what you see in the top plot here. So PFT is plant functional type, and what you're looking at is the leaf area index of different plant functional types up here. And I just wanna draw your attention to, as you, as you move towards the Holocene here, you start to get a lot more of this dark green showing up here. And that corresponds to temperate broadleaf evergreen trees becoming more dominant as you move towards the present. Uh, so the key point here is total vegetation cover doesn't change so much, but actually what's growing there is changing a lot, which means that if we're interested in how vegetation might influence landscape uh, processes, we need to be thinking about individual plant functional types like that. Okay, this then brings me to the last part of this where I wanna give you an application and looking at millennial timescale vegetation effects. So what we have here is, uh, I mean, this audience is fairly familiar with landscape evolution models, but the idea is we're simulating kind of generic plots of land here. We're going to, in these different study areas, we have a relatively uniform rock uplift rate between all of them. We take the climate history from uh, this trace 21K data, but, and that feeds in and gives us our uh, vegetation history through LPJ gas. And then what we're doing is calculating fluvial and hill slope erosion as a function of uh, different amounts of vegetation there. The way we're doing that is we're using the land lab space model. And uh, the, the point here is that uh, this, if you essentially were parameterizing things like the entrainment of sediment or the entrainment of rock <clears throat> as a function of, of the different abundances of the different plant functional types here. So to get into this just a little bit more, uh, you know, the fundamental equation we're solving here is conservation of mass. So we're calculating an erosion rate versus time at different points on the landscape. That's a function of the tectonic rock uplift. And then we have the hill slope erosion removing this. And so what we're doing here is uh, we're essentially following the approach of Istanbulo and Bras, where uh, the hill slope diffusivity is a function of the vegetation cover. And then for the fluvial or overland flow component here, the erosion and sedimentation are uh, controlled by the Manning's roughness number of variations between grass, shrubs, and trees. And we weight those numbers based on the amount of uh, those different plant functional types on any individual cell there, okay? So the coupling of this is, was not trivial. Um, and when you're doing synthetic experiments like this, you always need to make sure your initial condition isn't influencing uh, your solution that you're looking at. So what we do is a, a spin-up phase. And in this case, it takes about 40 million years to get an equilibrium landscape at those slow tectonic rates. So we, we run that uh, a simulation with that, with a fixed LGM climate, okay? Then the, uh, the landscape is essentially in equilibrium after that point. And then we go into our last 20,000 years where we're imposing transient clim <clears throat> climate, <clears throat> excuse me, climate and vegetation conditions uh, in, in the models here. So LPJ guess gets a climate for that time step, calculates the vegetation cover variations across the landscape, that feeds into land lab, we get erosion, changes our landscape, that changed landscape and changed soil thickness feeds back into LPJ gas and we just keep going here and we're done. Okay, so what do you get from this? Well, I'll just show you two examples here starting with the arid Atacama region, okay? And then the temperate south location here. Again, time on the horizontal axis from LGM to present, 
The red line is mean annual temperature, which doesn't matter so much for the erosion, but matters a lot for the plants. And then what's shown here on the left side is the vegetation cover for grasses, shrubs, and trees after amalgamating different plant functional types together. Now, uh, what you see is, okay, there's variability in the vegetation cover, but there's not a lot of it there, which isn't a surprise. Uh, we've actually, the Atacama region has been, been similar to today for over 19 million years. However, if you go to the south, what you see is the effect I illustrated before in the previous plot. This dark green line is the, uh, the trees here. And you see, as you move towards present here, you get a higher abundance of trees, lower abundance of, of shrubs and, uh, I'm sorry, grass and shrubs uh, stays quite low as well. Okay, so from this then, after you go through the kind of the coupling with, with land lab, uh, what I show on the right-hand side then are the average erosion rates over the entire model domain for that time history. Again, in the arid north here, I'll point out this dash line that runs through the middle here. This is the mean erosion rate, and this is actually defined by tectonics, okay? So, in uh, what we're seeing in the north then, is you get this high frequency variation in uh, catchment erosion rates that's basically oscillating around that mean value there. In the south, it's a little bit different. It's not oscillating so clearly around that mean here, and you see some shifts either higher or lower from that. What this implies then is that these, uh, these landscapes are actually constantly in a state of transients from this forcing here. And the magnitude of these changes in these transients is on the order of 10 to, 10 to 25% here. Uh, that's important because a lot of the proxy records that we look at, for example, from cosmogenic radionuclides or sediment inventories over these time scales, we may not actually be capturing what we think is the, the rate of tectonic uplift or rock, rock uplift of a landscape through these. The natural question, though, is, well, with this variability you see in erosion rates, how much of this is actually driven by the vegetation change versus the climate change? For example, in the south here, you notice that the precipitation history uh, has a similar shape to that as the, uh, as the erosion rates here. So what's driving what? Well, we've done a lot of different sensitivity tests on this with isolating or fixing different parameters, and I don't have time to show all that. So what I'll show you is just a very simplified perspective of this, where we look at the, over those time series, we calculate the Pearson correlation coefficient uh, between erosion rate, which is in the left-hand column here, and different parameters. So MAP is mean annual precipitation. And then down here, we have the correlation with the abundance of, of these three main plant functional types. And veg here represents the total vegetation cover of the landscape. So what you see for the arid at a comma region is that you have a moderate correlation between precipitation and, um, and the erosion rates. And you have a very weak to no correlation between vegetation and uh, uh, and erosion rates. So this would be very similar to the left-hand side of the long bind shown curve, where you have very little vegetation and the more it rains, the more erosion you get. Situation is different in the temperate south, and I'm sorry, I can't show you the whole sequence of areas to illustrate how this changes as you move from north to south. But what I wanna illustrate is that again, if you're looking there, okay, you have a high positive correlation with erosion and precipitation in the temperate south. So the more it rains, the more it erodes. Okay, it makes sense. But if we look at the vegetation covers here, and in particular, the total vegetation cover, you have a very strong inverse correlation. So more vegetation, less erosion, which is also what we see in the long bind shown curve there that I showed at the beginning. Okay, so very different behavior. So if we come back to our hypothesis here then, uh, does vegetation in, induce this kind of bi-directional effect on erosion? And, uh, and the, the short answer is yes, it does. Uh, observations, which I haven't been able to show you, but and modeling work that we've done uh, shows that different amounts of vegetation can have a positive, negative, or no correlation with erosion and can kind of cause this bi-directional response that's predicted uh, or was suggested by Longbine and Schoen. The key thing here is that arid regions are more sensitive to precipitation and temperate regions are sensitive to both precipitation and vegetation but there's a stronger effect of vegetation in those types of settings there. The last thing I wanna highlight is that uh, you always have a state of transient within catchments on millennial timescales when you're looking at vegetation and climate change. These changes in erosion rates around the mean will be on the order of 10 to 25%. Uh, 
Uh, so you have this has a lot of implications for observations, as I mentioned, but it's important to realize that tectonics is still what is defining the mean rate of erosion in, in these catchments. So that is all I have. Thank you. I need a drink. Um, we have time for a question. This is, this is probably a really naive question, but how much tectonic uplift do you get over 20,000 years? Over 20,000, well, time <clears throat> depends where you are, but- Well, there, in that system. In that system, uh, 20,000 times uh, 0.05 millimeters per year. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. But it's, uh, so what, I, I'm not sure where you're getting at with that, but it's, oh, oh, okay. I mean, over, over, you know, 40 million years, the relief in these landscapes, it kind of equilibrates at around 800 meters to a kilometer uh, topographic relief. So when you take into account the tectonic uplift and the erosion, it's brought it down. So yeah. one more question or I should hold away there. Tamara in the back there. Okay, all right. Thank you. My exercise is worth Faster, Mark, faster. Uh, that was super cool to see um, after reading the paper. <laughs> it's really cool. Uh, I was curious about the, when you show the plot between the, comparing the Arid and the South, and uh, the South has this like a step that matched the shape of the precipitation changes, but the Arid had these like wiggling um, around the average. Um, did that plot also had a precipitation or what do you think are the reasons of those changes in the erosion rate? Like in the in south. This, in the arid region. In the arid region. Uh, the, it's a good point. So it's mostly coming from precipitation. There's a very weak, uh, weak correlation with vegetation there. So, um, and it turns out uh, if you move a little bit south from there and start adding a little bit more shrubs, the response starts to change a lot. So it, it really is just kind of an end member. It kind of makes sense. I mean, it's the Atacama, you're gonna be most sensitive to stochastic rainfall events coming on the landscape. And that's, that's causing most of the variability. And the model that you couple for the reconstruction of the paleoclimate, um, how, just like, I don't know how that works, but like how, what information do, you, do they use to recreate the paleoclimate? The paleoclimate, okay, yeah. uh, that's an entire field on its own, but you need the, the mean orbital parameter uh, as it's changed through time. And uh, then you need the greenhouse gas concentrations, which we have good understanding of. Uh, you need land surface change. And so you need some sort of soil uh, and that's usually assumed to be similar to today's soil. Uh, that's very important because the soil moisture has a strong effect on the climate. And then in those particular simulations, they also had a dynamic, very coarse dynamic vegetation model to influence the land cover. And then the final really important thing is the sea surface temperatures. And, and those, are, those are calculated, that's a coupled ocean atmosphere model. And there are proxy data that help constrain it, but then it's dynamically updating what the sea surface temperatures are as you move towards present. Thank you.